I've had uh, a few folks on this show before, uh, from members of Congress to Wall Street ambassadors. Uh, we've had them all on this show, and uh, for that, with the, the, the guests I have tonight, uh, I'm so grateful and appreciative with them, because uh, certainly in today's time, in today's society, black America is again at a pivotal moment of truth. Uh, racial inequality, uh, justice, uh, once again has risen its proverbial head, although I don't think it ever really lowered it. Um, is at the center of our misguided belief that uh, in this millennial age, America is somehow experiencing a post-racial society. Uh, and of course, black America uh, had broken the barriers in 2008. At least that's the belief is that black America broke the barriers uh, once President Obama was elected. Uh, but I, I, I have my guest tonight who will challenge me on that or, or uh, confirm that for me, actually. Um, we felt, or they felt, or uh, we all felt that it was solidified in 2012 and that uh, all of the problems would somehow fade away because we had a black man in the White House. And uh, it seemed as if folks were saying, well, you know, we painted the White House black, so we good now. We good. Everybody's okay. and Everything's going to be all right. Uh, but that didn't happen, and many of us realized that didn't happen. And in fact, it seems as if uh, things have gotten worse. Not seems, they have. Uh, all the things that were still left, the, the economic growth and things that we had that were still left from the 90s is completely evaporated uh, in 2009 when the infamous and famous You Lie outburst from Congressman Joe Wilson during the State of the Union, uh, that outburst signaled the turning back of the hands of time to an era once believed to have been so far gone that uh, we would never have to revisit that again. But those two words, in the middle of a State of the Union address to the President of the United States, who happened to be African American, uh, sent a signal. It sent a signal to ensure that although you may be the President of the United States, we are going to make sure that nothing you do is ever going to succeed or if it does succeed, we're going to try to tear it down no matter how we do it. Now, I've never witnessed that with any other president. I've never witnessed anything, any type of outburst from not only the guests or, or certainly not members of Congress um, that, that would have you think or have you saying something of such a, a nature as you lie. And mind you, this was uh, January 2009. The man had just got elected in 2008. <laughs> so what was he lying about when he hadn't even gotten started yet? So I want to uh, talk about that because uh, it seems that uh, we're in an era that we uh, once believed was you know, far gone, that, that uh, racial equality had arrived with the election of President Obama, that, that uh, justice had arrived, that there would no, be no more uh, uh, police officers shooting you know, black men or beating them up, that uh, we wouldn't have to worry about the predatory lending issues, that you know, we would be able to you know, get houses or do things. Even though at that particular time we were going through a, a deep recession, but that recession seems to have not stopped in the black community. That recession seems to be continually. Um, so black America, those days have returned and to discuss them with me tonight is former guest on our show, Andrew Duncan. Uh, he calls himself the Black Rebel. Andrew is a member of the Southern Heritage Group, an organization that proudly supports the Confederacy and its history. Uh, joining Andrew uh, also is uh, my good friend, uh, uh, Warren Christopher. Warren Christopher is a candidate for uh, Congress in the 4th District of Maryland, uh, the state of Maryland. Uh, he is a uh, former chief of staff with the Department of uh, Interior and a lieutenant colonel, uh, Army veteran, uh, and served in our armed services. And then also joining us tonight is our first time guest, which I'm very proud to have and excited to have, and that is uh, Dr. Uh, Eddie Glaude. Dr. Glaude is the author of Democracy in Black. Uh, he is also the uh, chair at the uh, chair of the African American Studies Department and uh, uh, professor of religion and African American studies at Princeton University. So please welcome my guests tonight and thank them for joining us. Welcome to the show, gentlemen. You know, the millennials are really beginning to see that 
wow, there is a disparity between the races. And so the way we begin to tackle that is we must bring our faith community to the table. We must bring our young um, professionals and young adults to the table. We must bring our whole community to the table to include our educators and our parents and, and, and other community leaders. Uh, whether it's the NAACP, the Urban League, the Congressional Black Caucus, bring to bear the entire uh, force that we have in our community so we can begin to address these issues from a united perspective, uh, whether that be small business, home ownership. I, I really appreciate what Dr. Glob said because we see in so many different facets the injustice, the injustice in healthcare, uh, healthcare disparities, whether it's uh, with um, black women's health or breast cancer or cervical cancer or um, colon rectal cancer or diabetes injustice we see it in unemployment the national unemployment rate five percent twice as uh, much in the black community right, right. we see it in housing we see it in small business with the lack of um, access to prime government contracts or the lack of uh, access to capital. In your introduction, you, you made made it clear that you know all of the economic gains of the 1990s, for the most part, have been wiped out. Right. Uh, when the housing market crashed, 240,000 homes in our communities were lost. So we've seen an increase in the wealth gap in our communities. The white wealth now is 13 times that of black wealth. Um, we we've, we've seen uh, 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 at the level of in terms of young families experiencing poverty right now. Uh, the data is, is startling. 38% of African American children are growing up in poverty. 38%. And what's so startling about that figure uh, is, is that for the first time since they've been collecting the data, there are, there are more poor African American children than there are poor white children. And there are three times as many white children as there are African American children. Uh, when we look at jobs, although we've seen an improvement in the labor market, we have to take a closer look and see that we're now currently at rates, you know, the job unemployment rate is currently what it was near the height of the recession, right? And then the jobs that we have received, many people are working harder, they're working longer, and they're not working for a livable wage. And so when we begin to talk about this, and, and, and part of what motivated me is that, you know, that we've been talking about this as if, you know, folks have been talking as if we've, we're experiencing recovery, that we've turned a corner economically, when most, many of our communities are in ruins, right, are in ruins. And so how do we get at that? How do we talk about that? What has happened that people can be willfully blind about the suffering that's taking place in our community? And so part of what I've argued, I said earlier is that, there, that at the heart of it is a value gap, that some lives are valued more than others. And that's not coming out of the mouths of loud racists, people who are running around calling people the N-word or taking over buildings in Oregon or wearing, you know, white hoods or sheets, right? It's actually in evidence in our practices, in the day-to-day -day choices we make and what I call racial habits. And so if we're going to really get at, if we're going to really close the value gap, we got to uproot those racial habits that inform the kinds of choices we're making day in and day out that, re that reproduce inequality in this country. Yes. Okay, yeah. Go ahead, uh, Colonel. Thank you, Dr. Galata. But you know, I was just tell you, I really want to, you know, take a deeper dive even into that because part of the district that I am seeking to represent, uh, Prince George's County. Prince George's County is known as the most affluent per capita African American county in the entire country. Yet our schools consistently rank at the bottom. Our the foreclosure start rate is absolutely shameful. It's astronomical. The recidivism rate, the incarceration rate, the health care disparities amongst black folks, the, the lack of access to health care for black folks, the number of homeless veterans, the number of seniors that continue to struggle to pay rent or to buy food or to pay for prescription drugs. And that county is led by black folk. And so you know, Dr. Glad, I appreciate what you're saying, but at some point, when do we look inward and say that we have a responsibility? And so I think that we have to begin to hold all of us accountable to make sure that we are delivering to, uh, uh, based upon, you know, our constituents' needs. And right now, we don't do that. People want to judge what happened in Baltimore and call those young people out their thugs, but that is the manifestation of 
people needs not being met. And I believe the way we begin to address those issues is, I had a boss to tell me a long time ago. He says, Warren, if you really want to have an impact, you need to make it to the boardroom. Because in the boardroom is where the policy is made. And so that is one of the reasons that I'm running for Congress, is to make sure that we're able to effectuate the, 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 and reforming the justice system. So our young black males are not in jail or paying the price for, you know, minor crimes for the rest of their lives. I see barriers that black people have set up racially. I see barriers that some white people have set up racially. Um, and I've seen barriers that they've set up black, black people set up within their own communities against other blacks just because they might be different. Um, or doesn't believe in the status quo, you could say, or um, of how typically you would think of a black person should be. Like, for example, when I went out to New Orleans, all I got was never seen a black person with a cowboy hat before. Um, saying that, um, things like, um, that for like how I talk, for how I was raised, um, things like that, um, saying that because how I act a disgrace to the black race. But, um, so I, I, I see it on all different levels and I see a racial barrier of people who judge me just for being black on the white side. So, um, it's a, it's a kind of barrier that, I do see from both sides, but again, I don't let that affect how I live my life. Understandably, understandably. So with, uh, understandably. So with that, and and I want to ask that question because you said you 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 do feel the um, the the tension, I guess, from white America just because you're black, and then that goes to the question of the um, the, the the rallies that you hold and and hosts and organizations. Uh, that uh, um, follow you or, or that you, you uh, uh, are a member of in terms of the, the Confederacy and the Confederate flag and things of that nature. How does that differ from uh, the feelings that you have from other white folks that may look at you as being black and just say, well, you know, yeah, you're black and, and I don't like you because of that. But yet through the Confederacy, uh, your black face sort of supports what they believe and how they feel, and so therefore they want to rally behind you whenever you hold rallies. Oh uh, yeah, it's, I, I see animosity from people who don't, from white people who don't support the Confederate flag and have it believe, that don't believe within the Confederate flag. I probably, I more hate from those people than I do people who support the Confederate flag. Um, also, I see more animosity from black people for my beliefs within believing in the Confederate flag. In fact, I just got death threats that I had a report yesterday from people from um, off of my YouTube page of saying how he's going to find me and kill me from my beliefs. So I see the violence from, again, it's, it's, it's I, I see, I hear more hateful comments, see more hateful comments from Facebook and get more um, hate from the black community for when we go up and do these rallies. Um, again, it's, it's, and even, and even, let's say, I don't support, um, I don't support ISIS, I don't support the Muslims, but if I see a brother that goes out there and is, is in kind of stuff, I'm not going to be out hating on him for his belief. We won't, you know, increase the minimum wage or living wage, but then we buy up everything. We're consumers on one half, but we're not wealth, wealthy in the other side of it. And so how do we deal with that um, in this poverty stricken environment? How are we going to effectually um, deal with the, 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 the lack of wealth in our community? You talk about the, the, county, that, uh, the uh, county that you're gonna be representing is the richest black county in the country. But yet the unemployment rate, the foreclosure rate is astronomical in terms of what it, you know, other parts of the country. How do we deal with that? So that is it's really, really uh, complex and we have to really peel back the onion and, and approach it from a number of different perspectives. I want to uh, suggest though that the foundation of this is in my mind a mental health issue. We in the black community should come to realize that we still suffer from the remnants of slavery. I 
personally believe, having been deployed to Iraq and Afghanistan as a combat veteran, that we have symptoms of post-traumatic stress disorder within the black community. And I'm not sure that and, we and are willing... And it continues to go down from generation to generation. Absolutely. And we, and we have a hard time understanding that when we all do well, we all do well. And so you have to approach it from a root cause analysis perspective. These are the root cause issues. How do we begin to address those issues? I believe that, you know, from time to time, we have to bring in a fresh crop of uh, people to represent us. No disrespect to those legacy leaders that have brought us to this point, but at some point you've got to say, my services, my effective service is done. It is time for me to take a knee and allow fresh vision, fresh perspective, fresh leadership to come in to begin to galvanize and to begin to collectively represent our issues, whether it is foreclosures. I'm particularly concerned about small business and minority owned small business and the access. You know, as the chief of staff at the Department of the Interior, having oversight of more than $57 billion in procurement and acquisitions, I didn't see black people coming to the table to get, those, get access to those prime government right, prime contracts. Government contract, and right. so if you're not at the table, then you're on the menu. Mm -hmm. And if you're on the menu, you don't, you're not counted. And so when it comes to even our black males, if you're in, incarcerated, you're not counted. You will become irrelevant in our community. And so people will teach you, they will treat you how we've taught them to treat us. And what we say to white people, what we say to uh, racist supremacists, we say to them that it's okay to deliver us a, a substandard education system. It's okay for you to come into our communities and prey on us with predatory lending. It's okay for you to come in. Come in and gentrify our and community. Gentrify, and, uh, and, and take over our community. And, and then we use we use some of these black elite, particularly elected officials or politicians, to help to carry out those uh, those kind of policies that, and those that kind black of face I talked about. Absolutely, and so I just think that we've got to really. Uh, you talked about millennials earlier. It is time for us to have a day of atonement in our community mm -hmm. to say that look, no longer can we accept. A, B, and C, whether it's foreclosures, whether it's the lack of access for small business, job creation, recidivism, incarceration, and even if it means us dismissing some of the elite politicians, black politicians, we've got to hold people accountable for representing us, whether you're a moderate, whether you're a liberal, whether you're a conservative. We've got to make sure that if you're not talking about how you're going to increase my bottom line, if you're not talking about how you're going to make my community safer or provide a better education for my children, if you're not talking about how you're going to ensure that my grandmother or my great-grandmother have access to a caregiver program or lowering rents on their senior in their in their properties or making sure that they get prescription drugs or cost of living or make sure that our veterans who fight on the front line get responsive medical treatment, if you're not addressing those issues very intently and very directly, I don't care if you're a Democrat, Republican, or an independent. You don't deserve our vote. When we look at things and we talk about things, especially coming from a, from a black perspective, and we somehow, some way, get the, the role of being the victim of society and everything, but for what is happening here, shouldn't we take time out to look at how we ourselves are treating ourselves in, uh, I mean, amongst ourselves, and it doesn't have to be exclusively in an urban area. Um, the gentleman himself said he grew up in rural Mississippi. I grew up in rural South Carolina, so I can relate to um, uh, a, 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 a close proximity to his farm I mean, again, I don't know him. I don't know exactly how he was raised, but I do know the, the values when you talk about being a southern boy and you talk about being a country boy. I got a big dose of the real world when I left home and I went to college and I was in ur urban areas and you know people tell me you can't do this because you're right, you can't do that. The majority of the times people that look like me. Now as you know, you guys know Andrew very well, um, an avid Confederate, Confederate flag supporter. I am also a Confederate flag supporter. I understand what you guys are saying regarding the, how it, it, the flag is viewed toward African Americans. But let's take the flag away for a second. And let's look at where you guys are talking about the quote unquote community. And let's look at what we're talking about, the treatment of African Americans now. You take the flag away, you take out everything else outside of the people and the situations in the community. And how, how can those things that are not there be a, a, 
be a, a, a problem or say a factor of the downfall of people there when you have people blatantly mistreating each other. You have black on black crime at, at such an astronomical rate that it's just ridiculous. You have um, people that are just unwilling to go out here and bet themselves. There are programs here that can help people out. And the, the, the politicians, all politicians, um, conservative or liberal, Democratic or Republican, black or non-black, all of them have a responsibility to the constituents. Because see, when you're running here, you're not running for just one particular person. You're not just running for one particular area. When you get into the, the federal limelight, you are actually representing the country by way of the the area that you come from. When you go to state government, you are actually representing the entire state based upon the area that you come from. But going back to what we're saying here, when we talk about the issues regarding blacks in itself, that's what I want to understand is how can something that's not prevalent in the, in the community be such a, a hindrance and a, such a symbol of oppression to one person when it's, you actually take a look at what that one particular person is doing to themselves and amongst themselves in a group. And, and I'm, I'm, I think I got what you're saying, uh, uh, BC, but, but uh, let me also re remind you that, yes, there is black on black crime, but there's also white on white crime and Latino on Latino crime. And there's more white on white crime than there is black on black crime. It's just that black on black crime. Oh, hold on now. Hold on. Hold on. There's more white on white crime than there is black on black. Just black on black is reported more. You see it more because the media wants to put it out there more. So let me let me be uh, uh, clear, clear on that. And hold on, hold on, hold on, BC. Hold, BC, BC, BC. Hold on. This is my show, okay? I let you talk, so I'm going to talk. Now, Andrew asked me to allow you to come on the show, and I told him, yes, yeah, so that's why your picture's up there. So I will apologize for putting your picture up there. I asked Andrew if you had a picture. I didn't get anything back, so I pulled from the Internet and put it up there. You're welcome to be on the show anytime. We can talk about anything you want to talk about, okay? So... I understand that you're saying, how is it that there, there's uh, uh, something going on in the community? Because we're going to take all the symbolism out. How is something going on in the community and it's still affecting the community? And that is because of the systemic nature of things. S the things that have been put in place, the barriers that have been put in place for and against African Americans, regardless of whether you see them or not, they are there. And because of the systemic nature of them, so if grandmama had it happen to her, she's already told granddaughter or she's told uh, daughter or son that it's happened. So now daughter and son take on the uh, feelings of what grandma had. So now they assimilate and they start acting accordingly. So if grandmama didn't do it, then son's not going to do it. Daughter's not going to do it. So they're going to tell their grandchildren not to do it. So are there, their children not to do it. So now the children don't do it. So you create a systemic problem that has been created throughout the system of government and other areas. And, and go ahead, uh, Dr. Glock. Be clear, the ghettos aren't, American ghettos aren't uh, uh, just accidents. Right. They're a result of policy. Right. Uh, when we look at housing policy in Absolutely. the country, uh, we look at the FAH, uh, we look at who had access uh, to, to guarantee loans uh, when the American middle class was being built in the post-World War II era. Um, African Americans were systematically locked out, right? So at the moment in which you have massive expansion of the American middle class because of racism, because of white supremacy, black folk locked out. When we look at what the policies of the New Deal made possible, right? What did those, what those policies made possible for American workers, white workers, right? Southern Dixiecrats were deliberate in keeping black folk out, locked out. But let's go even more, let's, go, let's not go that far back. Let's just look at it. We can talk about the major legislation passed in the context of the Civil Rights Movement. Most of us talk about the 1964 Civil Rights Act, the Voting Rights Act of 1965. But the last major piece of legislation that was passed was in 1968. That's the Fair Housing Act. And of course, we have the War on Poverty with, with President Lyndon Johnson being pushed by the grassroots mobile, grassroots organizing of, led by Dr. King and others. But just 
less than 12, year, 12 years later. 1968 was the last piece of major, major legislation which we know was forestalled, which was not implemented in all of its, in all of its details. That's right. But just 12 years later, we elect Ronald Reagan. And all of it is systematically attacked. Right? 68, we have the current commission saying we, we have two Americas. Right? So the argument that is being said or being made is that over 200 plus years of slavery, over the context of Jim Crow, 100 plus years of Jim Crow, and then over this really brief period of time, the last piece of legislation in 68, over 12, over that, in that period, then 12 years later, you have a white backlash that's represented by the election of Ronald Reagan in 1980, that somehow we had reversed generations of policy and practice that effectively relegated black people, right, to the bottom rung of this society. I appreciate and let me be very honest and clear. I appreciate your passion for what you believe and why you believe it. But please do not make the mistake or make the blanket statement that black folks are making excuses about what's going on in America. Now, granted, some black folks will, just like some white folks do. Granted. But the systematic structure of this country. I said it before to you before. When you have a system of government and a structure that has created that already classified you as three-fifths of a person, of a human being, that system has never been changed to allow you to be a one whole. So when that system is structured and that, uh, that, that uh, structure has been put in place, it continues. What uh, Dr. Glad just talked about in the Voting Rights Act what we talked about in terms of, of uh, home ownership, all those things are systems. Redlining, all those things are systems. He no, I'm not three-fifths of a person, but by the Constitution, but by the Constitution, if you ever take time to read the Constitution, have you ever read the Constitution? Have you ever, have you ever read the Constitution? Any of y'all from being a full human being, so you tell me the Constitution makes you three-fifths of a person, so what makes you any different than anybody else or any of the other black people, or makes me any different from any of the other black people that can go out and make themselves a full person? Andrew, 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 clearly Andrew, clearly Andrew, Andrew, clearly UMBC, clearly UMBC don't understand. Clearly you don't understand. So, so let me do this, let me do this. Let me do this, okay? Let me just shut you down and shut you off because clearly you have taken it to the whole other level that you have no comprehension or understanding of what we're actually talking about.